connect to the station at once. And so Nick has a dark eyed junco right now. And every bird that we get will measure its leg with this leg gauge. And so that allows us to make sure that the bird is receiving the correct band for its size and weight. Uh, these bands are from the USGS and they're made of aluminum. So they're really light. Um, they're kind of like a watch or a bracelet that you might wear. And they have a individualized serial number on them. So it's sort of like giving a bird a social security number when we um, put the bands on and we have these really specialized banding pliers there. You can open them with that little post and then close them with the holes. Um, and we use that to make sure that the fit is perfect. Um, you'll see Nick test the fit later, I think on a different bird, but um, yeah, I mean, it really does fit just like a watch or a bra bracelet does on you. And just like a watch or a bra bracelet, uh, after a few days, you don't even notice that you have it on. So it's the same thing with the birds. And um, so the dark eyed junco that's in Nick's hand right now in the Northeast, I think here I'm just showing you the numbers and making sure that everyone can see each number um, on the band. And um, so the species that we see in Michigan of the dark eyed junco is the slate colored junco. Um, so it's going to be really gray all around. Juncos have a nice white uh, outer tail feathers that you can kind of see there on the other side of the bird. Um, and I think Nick's saying here something about how it has a sort of short and thick beak that's good for eating seeds. And I think he's saying that it's a male dark eyed junco. So on some birds, we can tell whether it's a male or a female based on size or based on plumage characteristics. And since that bird is so dark gray, um, not very brown, we can tell that it's a male. And his wing measurement, which Nick is taking right now, um, you're able to tell that by the, the size of the wing and the size of the bird. And he's also measuring the tail right now. So when scientists ban birds, some things that we take information on are um, the species of the bird, obviously, um, the age and sex of the bird, the wing and tail measurements, and sometimes some other measurements depending on the species and the project. And we also look at the body condition of the bird. So we're looking at things like, does it have a lot of fat? Does it have a really strong muscle? Um, is there anything else we can see on the bird like parasites or any health issues maybe? And I hope Nick wasn't saying anything too important. <laughs> We have a question of why is he blowing on it? Is it to spread the feathers? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's exactly right. So um, in, a, in a little bit, you'll be able to see up close and personal what Nick is seeing. But when he's blowing on the bird, he's blowing the feathers apart so that he can see underneath them and so that he can see the skin. And so one really important tool that bird banders use is this book that Nick's looking at right now called um, The Guide to Aging and Sexing North American Land Birds, I think. Um, it's by Peter Pyle and it's basically the bander's Bible. It has information, very detailed information on every species that you could catch in North America, information on aging and sexing them, their measurements, um, and some information about subspecies identification and some life history. So for a normal person, it would be 
very confusing and very boring, but for us, uh, it takes a long time to be able to read and understand it correctly, but uh, it, we couldn't we couldn't band without it. And right now, Nick is uh, weighing a bird, so we just kind of put them in a little film canister and stick them upside down for just one second while we get a weight on them and then take them out and let them go. Um, so for most birds, they've never been upside down before. Um, so they're kind of confused and they are just like, um, what's going on? And then before they know it, it's over and we know how much they weigh. Um, so Nick is grabbing another bird. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to turn my phone on airplane mode. Hey, Leah, we can't hear you. All right. Is... Sorry, everyone. Lots of technical difficulties today. Um, so maybe if you mute one of me, and then leave my computer, uh, on, then you can be able to hear me. 
Yeah. Right now, there's minimal echo. Okay. Perfect. So, so I'll just press play again. And again, I really apologize for uh, this, <laughs> but we do the best that we can. So, uh, American Tree Sparrow, it has a dark central breast um, spot. So that's similar to a tree, or sorry, a song sparrow and also a house sparrow, but American tree sparrows are, um, they don't have a streaky breast. And I don't know if you could hear earlier, I mentioned the bicolored bill of an American tree sparrow. So that dark upper mandible and the yellow lower mandible, you can see really well right here. And so just like I was saying before, Nick's making sure that that band fits really well. So you can see that it spins around. Um, so, you know, it's not too tight, not too loose. It's just the right size. And again, just taking the wing and tail measurement. So at our feeders, we are just feeding with um, black oil sunflower seeds. And so we're getting a lot of seed eating birds at our feeders. Um, earlier in the winter when we were just doing feeder watch, we um, were not getting very much diversity. So I was a little nervous about how this banding demonstration would go. Um, but luckily now that spring migration is happening, we are uh, getting a lot more diversity. So that's exciting. And what's really cool about birds is that they've evolved to be able to fly and fly um, in the really large distances that they can. So I think that Nick shows us this fat in a little bit. So birds have hollow bones and they have really thin skin that we're able to see underneath when we have them in the hand. And that's what allows us to see the fat and the muscle like we're about to right now. So the fat is that sort of yellowy orange stuff closer to Nick's fingers, right where I'm pointing. And the pink surrounding that is the bird's muscle. So especially during migration, it's really important for birds to be fat and muscular. That means they're gonna have enough energy to continue their flight north up to their breeding grounds, wherever that may be. And birds are really good at turning fat into energy much better than we are as humans. So having a really fat bird is a really good thing for their health during migration. All right, goodbye little bird. So it just takes a few minutes, if that, to process a bird when we're not, um, you know, showing them to the public, it can happen a lot faster. Then we just let them go back to their own business. I'm sure that bird will be back at our feeder later today, probably right now. And so this next bird is a real treat for us today. Um, so we live near river and we hear this bird singing a lot. Um, I've never known if it, for sure, if it came into our yard to our feeders, but today when we walked out to get the birds out of the net to ban them, it was a really great surprise to see this 
So if you don't know, that's a red-winged blackbird, a really common bird in wetlands and marshy areas. Um, and so really exciting for us to get to see. You can tell that it's a male because um, it's dark black and it has that really nice red and orangey epaulet for its little shoulder decoration. And so oftentimes the males in birds are the showy beautiful ones and the females are more drab. So the males are using this gorgeous plumage to defend territory, to attract mates. And females who are more drab are often doing a lot of the nesting and so they wanna be able to be safe for, um, their nest in themselves to be safe from predators. So they don't wanna be noticed as much. And so this is one of the bigger bands that we're able to put on songbirds. And so we know um, the, the number of the band that is on this little guy. I think it's 982. And so we'll know if we catch him again that he's hanging out in our yard or maybe if someone else catches him somewhere else at some point in his life, they'll know, well, okay, he was in Northern Michigan at some point. And so one of the things that banding data can help scientists learn is the movements of birds. Um, there are several banding stations south of us. There is one in Kalamazoo and one in Lansing that I know about. Um, and so they could recapture him on his journey back south in the fall. And some other cool things that we can learn from banding data is things like migration timing. Over many years, you can see, you know, if there's been any difference in when birds start migrating, when you see specific species at your site. Another thing you can learn about is the demography of populations or what different age classes there are there. And so um, MAPS, which is a summer breeding banding protocol, is really good at this. It helps tell how many young of the year were born and how many adults there are. Um, another thing that banding can tell us is we can track individuals of endangered or threatened species. Not only can we maybe do that by recapturing them and reading their band number, but we also have specialized bands called color bands. Very nice little epaulets there. So colored bands can help us determine individuals from far away without having to catch them just by reciting them through binoculars. And I think we're, oh, so we're looking at how to age this bird. So for red-winged blackbirds, one really easy way to look at that is to look at the underwing coverts and to see if there's a limit there. So for bird banders, a limit means that there's a difference that you can see between two different age groups of feathers. And in a second, we'll go to our pile guide that shows a picture of this. So you can see on that top picture, um, you can see the limit between the two different age groups of feathers, the white ones versus the black ones. And in the bottom picture, you can see that there is no limit because all the feathers are the same. So basically that just tells us that this is an adult bird. And feather age and feather quality, which is not really something that we'll get into today, um, but that those are two really important things that banders look at to be able to age birds. Because kind of just like humans who have baby teeth that aren't very good teeth because we know we're gonna lose them soon. 
versus our adult teeth that are much better and stronger. Birds kind of do the same thing with their feathers. So their young feathers are of less quality because they know that they're gonna molt them soon. And adult feathers that are gonna last longer until their next molt are of better quality um, and sometimes different shapes. So that's something that we can tell with the bird in the hand. So something that I kind of forgot to talk about as much as I wanted to during the original taping of this video, but now I have time to, is eBird. And so that's a really amazing tool that citizen science and people interested in birds and people who watch birds can use to help track populations, track rare species sightings, um, and you can do it all from your phone or your computer. So it's really accessible. And uh, so you can just download an app or sign up online and just bird and keep track of all the birds that you see or hear. Yeah, I think he was able to get a weight on that. Um, we didn't have a great tube that he fit perfectly in. So that one might have been a little bit too big, but there he goes. And here is another dark-eyed junco, specifically the slate-colored subspecies that we would most likely find here in Michigan. And so looking at maybe your feeders or if you're a beginner birder, one of the best things that you can do to try and figure out how to identify birds is Generally, number one, just look at their shape and size. So is it bigger or smaller than an American robin? Is it bigger or smaller than a crow? Or is it bigger or smaller than a sparrow? And so these are all pretty common birds that people, even non-birders have a general idea of what they look like and their size. So that's a really good thing to do. Um, and then another good thing is to look at their beak shape, and that's something that I mentioned before. The sparrows, they have these sort of shorter and thicker bills, and so you can use that shape to try and narrow it down to what family the bird belongs in, and that'll help you instead of saying, well, I need to look through the hundreds of birds that may occur in Michigan and instead narrow that, narrow that down to, well, I can look at the sparrows that occur in Michigan or maybe the sparrows that occur in Northern Michigan and visit bird feeders. And so that'll really help you figure it out much faster than looking through every single bird. Yeah, so we're banding right now, um, basically just for education for this banding demonstration. I think Nick's showing that this is another male. And so we're just banding at our house in Sheboygan um, where we had feeders up all winter. 
in where we took some Project Feeder Watch citizen science data. And then when we were done with that, we put up our nets. And now we're banding these birds today for you guys. And you can kind of see those white outer tail feathers that a junco has. I really love that about them. Um, a lot of times when they fly, when they flush and begin to fly, they flare their tails and you can see those outer tail feathers. And I just think that they're really cute. Yeah, I don't know about Gail's question about um, dark-eyed dark juncos remaining here longer, but that's one thing that citizen science projects like eBird and Project Feeder Watch can help people determine. So it's really important if you are seeing those birds to keep recording that information. And a lot of scientists have begun publishing papers on data that they've gathered from eBird. And so um, here, I just wanted to show a, a few ways that maybe having bird feeders and participating in things like Feeder Watch can be a little bit more affordable and easy. So this is a bird feeder we made this winter from an old milk carton. Uh, you could use sticks. We just kind of found these weird little wooden dowels that we used. Um, so, you know, this is something that you probably already buy every day anyways, and it's not going to cost you an arm and a leg. This we found in our landlord's garage, a little homemade feeder that could hold either suet blocks or it could hold seeds. So if you have some scrap laying around, you know, you have the ability to make your own feeder. You don't have to buy some fancy setup. You can kind of figure it out on your own. And I don't know if I mentioned this in the beginning or not, but another thing about feeder watch and just about birding in general is that kind of more important than feeders is having a good habitat for the birds to live in. So if you have maybe fruit trees in your yard or if you are doing some landscaping and decide you wanna do some native plant landscaping, that's gonna be one of the best things that you can do for birds and other wildlife in general. And so now I'm making my way into our backyard to our mist nets. And this is a really common way that scientists study songbirds. So it's a really long and tall net made of pretty thin mesh. And so you can see those little squares are pretty small. So just like a fishing net, if you wanna have the right size of net for the size of birds that you're catching, a large bird like a red-tailed hawk wouldn't even get caught in this type of net. And if our holes were any bigger, little songbirds might be able to wiggle through. So the birds can't see it when they're flying. So what happens is they fly into the net and kind of hang out in that little hammock where my hand was waiting for us to come get them. And this is just our feeder setup. Um, so some of the things we bought and some of the things we made like our homemade squirrel baffles that we tried to make out of dollar store garbage cans. That didn't really work. <laughs> Squirrels don't stop. Um, so it's, it's a good thing when you're putting up feeders to have this brush and shrubbery and trees around so that the birds have some cover to hide from any predators that might come out. And it's also important to have your feeders 30 feet or 30 feet away from windows or less than three feet away. Um, so I'll show that in a second. 
and our feeders are pretty far away from our house. Um, and you can see there that you can't even see the net on the screen. So imagine if you were a bird or even just a person walking by, you wouldn't be able to see it. And then you can see that our neighbor has birds feeders and they're really close to her windows. So having birds less than three feet away from your windows or more than 30 feet away from your windows helps keep birds from hitting your windows. So just like that net that they can't see, they don't understand the concept of windows. So if they see some clear passageway, they are gonna go through it. And so thank you guys. Uh, thanks again for putting up with these technical difficulties. And I think that's the end of the video. And so I'll try and switch over here. All right. Um, so if anyone has any other questions, feel free to shout them out or I guess uh, say them on the Q&A. And I have some more information and some more closer photographs in case anyone is curious about any of the data that we take on the birds that we banned or any more information on eBird or Feeder Watch. I don't uh, work for Cornell. I just participate in both of those projects because I love birds. And even though I get to be a scientist during the day for my job, um, I like to be able to help as much as possible and get to do it on the weekends too. Um, let's see. So one cool thing on Project Feeder Watch is that it can help you identify the birds that are coming to your feeder. And so I clicked here, the food that I have out, which is black oil, sunflower seeds, and where I am in the world. And that helps me narrow it down. So then if I know what the beak shape of the bird looks like, or maybe its size, I can narrow it down between all these species that are expected and find my bird. We have a lot of chickadees, so I thought that we would find one of those um, today but it gives you a whole bunch of information and their range and fun facts about them and species that they could be confused with. Um, yeah, so bird bands in binoculars. So you can, is as the smaller the bird, the more difficult that gets. Um, so with small songbirds, um, when people are reciting them, they put color bands on them. So things like bright green or bright, bright blue are probably not colors that you're gonna find commonly in nature especially right underneath a bird that you're watching. Um, so that's one way that scientists can figure out how to identify a bird um, just by sight, an individual. For larger birds, sometimes it's easier to get the band number off of the bird just by looking through binoculars. I think this more often happens with really good photography equipment. Um, let's see if I can change. So here, I think these are all raptor sized bands. So if you can see my mouse, the one furthest on the left is what you would put on a, a eagle or a snowy owl. And so you could potentially, if you can see the leg clearly enough, look at the band number and be able to tell. Um, but more often with a camera, you could tell that. And then here's just a, another better look of muscle and fat. So this is a really fat female 
um, black-headed girl speak that I took this picture of in Idaho. She has a lot of fat. She's maybe the, one of the fattest birds that I've ever seen. And um, she's got a lot of muscle too. So you can see the distinct color differences there. And this is right after breeding season. And so the reason that her belly is so bare and it's so easy to blow those feathers away and see is that she used to have what's called a brood patch. And that's something that helps female birds laying on eggs keep them warm. And so they lose all the feathers on their belly and kind of develop a blister to help keep those eggs nice and warm. Well, I think we have a few minutes left of this presentation time slot. So if anyone has any other questions, uh, let me know. Yeah, thank you, Leah. Um, um, How did you become interested in birds? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I kind of got voluntold to do a project about birds at work one year when I was working at a state park in New York. And then I pretty much thought, these are pretty cool. I kind of like this. And so I went after um, more bird jobs and I got them and have learned a lot in just a few years. So it's been pretty fun. Are there any ways that people can support this project or visit or anything like that? Um, so we just did the feeder banding for the MSU Science Fest. Um, MSRW doesn't do any songbird banding right now. They do do raptor, so diurnal raptor, which means raptors that are awake in the daytime and owl banding. Um, neither of those are open to visitors, at least for right now. Um, but they also do hawk and water bird migration counts. And those are open to visitors um, with, you know, COVID safety protocols in place. Um, and you can check out information on that on Mackinac Straits Raptor Watch's website, um, or you could follow us on Facebook at Mackinac Straits Raptor Watch on Facebook and get some more information on that. Awesome. Don't see any more questions. Well, if anyone thinks of anything that I didn't answer uh, during the presentation, like it says at the bottom of this slide, Gus on Mackinac Straits Facebook page, and we'll make sure you get an answer. Um, and thanks again for putting up with all the technical difficulties and sticking with us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Be sure to check out the rest of Expo Day events today on our website and throughout the rest of April. So thank you. Bye everyone. Thanks.